Good. So, not a full session. I understand it's a bit late. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, probably something that is a very interesting topic to most of you. Um, as you're running uh, businesses, one of the key questions is talent, is culture, is scaling. So we have today um, five panelists. I will make a very, very quick uh, introduction about them. So uh, Lucian Tarnowski um, from Brave New Talent, social um, learning platform. Uh, it's about, we call it university uh, for, uh, uh, for content. Second person is uh, Ole Menching uh, from Carrot Team. It's HR strategy and recruitment for internet companies. Third is Sherry Kutu. I will be quick because I could spend a lot of time as you have a very impressive uh, resume. Um, on the advisory board of LinkedIn, uh, career as an executive and also board member. Manny Gill from Renovata Partners, uh, head hunter. Um, we've done a, a lot of work with Manny. Uh, great, uh, great head hunter. And Ralph uh, Bowman from Stepstone, uh, CEO of Step, uh, Stepstone uh, Total Jobs. So, very quick introduction before we go into questions and the main purpose of uh, tonight will be to try to give you as many tips as we can based on our own experiences. The first thing is, um, just introduce myself, Dominic Vidal, I'm a um, VC with uh, Index. I basically had three lives. I had a life as an entrepreneur, I had a life as a, a corporate life, and a life as an investor. And if you think about, most of the time, what you try to do when you think about uh, what you want to achieve, the first thing that comes to my mind is, I want to make an impact in everything I do. And the way to make an impact, you want to bring a strong contribution and you want something that can scale. Being an entrepreneur, being part of corporate life or as a VC, the only place where you can make a strong impact and scale is probably recruitment. So as a VC, if you think, if I help a company recruit a great talent, this person is going to spend 60, 70 hours per week in the company. Whatever I do, I will spend four or five hours. This will make a big difference if I attract the right talent. If you think about managing a business, it's exactly the same. There is a point in time where your own time, where you give advice to people, is limited. It works very well when you have 10 people. It doesn't work as well when you have 1,000. So the best impact where it really scales is when you recruit great talents. So we'll kick off this session, and um, we'll try to make it, at one point, interactive. First. We we'll try to divide in two steps. The first question is going to be related to the growth phase, okay? You're scaling a business very quickly. The second question, the second part will be related to what is happening when growth is slowing down and you have to retain, keep the talents in the company. So first phase, growth phase, what does it take to bring the right people on board uh, at the beginning, let's say when you have 10, 50 people, or when you have 200, 500 people. Who wants to take the first question? Manny, you want yep, to start? Absolutely. Um, so I think at the beginning uh, of an organization, it's more about you're defining the vision and the mission. Um, and you need to bring people on board who, first of all, believe in the mission, believe in your vision, and basically are action and execution oriented. So you need the entrepreneurialism, you need the energy, and you want individuals who are just going to bring something additive to the, to the organization, to the culture, and just go and execute what's needed in the early days. That's what I would say at this stage. Yeah, maybe I want to add something here. Um, Marco, I think Marco said yesterday um, at the dinner that he likes numbers. 
Um, I thought he meant companies and numbers about companies, but I like numbers too. And I mean, everybody is um, telling that we or that a company really needs good people. And I want to um, add some numbers to that. Um, meter studies show that um, I think we are talking about managerial and expert jobs here. And meter studies show that the top 15% um, of this group, of this job group. I'm not talking about the top five or the top one percent. Um, the top 15 percent um, are generating 50 percent more output than the average worker in managerial and expert jobs. So now when we are in a phase of growth, when, when a, a company is just starting, we have a very complex and uncertain situation. In such situations, um, very good people are even better. That means um, that this gap between average worker and um, very good workers um, is, is just rising, is um, getting bigger. And that's why I would say, um, first and foremost, you need really, really, really good um, people in the beginning. I think I... Um, oh, sorry. Sure. <laughs> Please, sure. No, let's continue. Um, so I, 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 I agree with you. I think when you're thinking of where you're going to scale as an entrepreneur, so when I was running my own company and hiring, um, you want to look at where you're going to be in two to three years' time. And I wanted to hire people who have been to where I want to get to. And maybe you'll think, oh, well, you know, do I really need someone who's worked in an organization that had 100 million in revenue? But if you think you've got a clear crack at getting 100 million revenue within three to five years, then that's where you should be hiring. And, uh, and I think that means that they're gonna be, they might be a little bit bored when they first arrive. But if you don't have them in place, then your alternative is either you don't get to your 100 million because the people can't scale with you, or God forbid you burn out people because they just don't have the skills or the ambition or the ability to get you where you need to go. And you need people who can um, row really hard with you in the, in the boat. And I think a big mistake that entrepreneurs often make is um, not hiring people who have been to where they want to go. Um, and you know, those that are lucky are those that have hired brilliant teams and attracted people who want to do, sorry, want to go on that journey and want to, want to get there. I actually, you said 50%. I have heard numbers as high as 22-fold productivity gaps. Yeah, I was talking about between... the top 15%. If you go to the top 5 or to the top 1%, it's much, much higher. Yeah, much, so, much higher. so hiring someone who's done it is probably 20 times better for your company yeah. every single day, every single hour of those 60 or 80 hours that they work than hiring somebody who hasn't done and that journey I mean, before. of course, the gap is also getting higher um, as higher the position is. I mean, a CEO <laughs> has much more influence on the whole company than a normal expert. Yeah. Okay, so to this point, and I'm going to ask you another specific question uh, related to that. Uh, back to having done it, how do you manage um, the internal promotion versus bringing people from the outside? Because it's a big dilemma for most organizations. If you only bring people from the outside, you're sending a kind of a bad signal, obviously, to people internally, because it means that there is no hope no opportunity, so you want obviously to promote, but you also want to create a mix of people, talent, who have done it in the past. I think it depends on how fast you're growing. If I look at, um, we've just done some numbers in, I live in Cambridge, and we've just done some numbers and shown that the top 50 fastest growing companies have hired 6,000 people last year alone, and on average grown their workforces by 25%. Um, so A, you can't hire internally if you're growing yeah. that fast, so it's almost irrelevant, the, the question. Um, and then do you promote them? It depends on if you've hired properly, not properly, if you've hired people who have been where you want to go to start with, then, they'll, then you can internally, you can promote them internally. But if you've hired you know, people who haven't been on that journey and haven't scaled up a company before, then you almost have to go um, externally to be able to fill those gaps, to be able to get your, your company to the next, okay, the next level. So I'm uh, going to be provocative can I, here. Can I, and I think, ask, so, sorry, can I just interject on that one? Just, just Cherry, just on, on your point about um, always hiring individuals who can take you to the next level. I think what we've, what we've seen in helping startups is you have to get the balance absolutely right. Because if you overhire too early, there's a danger that the individual coming on board doesn't have actually enough to do. And the, the second thing is if the business doesn't have the, the scale and the momentum, to be able to attract that type of senior person in the first place is, is also going to be very risky because then you waste a lot of time and energy trying to recruit individuals, you're overshooting 
for the individuals no, I agree. I before think they come on board. So, so I, I also want to add something. <laughs> so, so, uh, I'm sorry, we have two more. So sorry. we're starting from the right. <laughs> sorry, guys. We need to go to the left. So I, please. No, no, it's, it's very interesting to listen. I think um, everybody has a different view of an organization in mind where they hire for. No? So the, the one thing I think what we are missing in the discussion is that you need to have a plan and hiring is a profession. And the last thing what you should do is distribute to everybody in the organization. No? And when you have a plan, and I think the one you talked about a vision and a mission, and you about a large scale organization, then automatically your hiring comes out. And it may be a mixture of people who were there, others where you believe you can promote them, and so on. But the bottom line is hiring and sourcing on various different levels. I think that's the biggest thing. So there's no advice how you, there's no blueprint. You have to be aware in which situation you are and, and where you want to go. And then all the answers are correct and right. No? One other statement which is provocating. Everybody talks about the best talent. I think that's a wrong statement. You need the right people for the job who fits in the team. And it could be a lower talent, but it makes a perfect team member to yeah. achieve a fantastic target. Yeah. I think yeah. that's I'd say I think it's um, all about how do you establish a meritocracy of talent. So if you are um, expecting to scale, and I think you know a lot of entrepreneurs here will know that quote from Steve Jobs that said only those crazy enough to think they can change the world ever do. You know, that founders uh, can really understand that. And so I don't think anybody ever creates a thousand person company by accident. People have that intent from day one. You know, Google had that scale in mind from day one and, and others like it. But I think um, a lot of people have talked about A players and what are A players. Uh, and people say that oh, A players hire other A players. B players hire C, C players because they're conscious that they don't want to replace themselves within the organization. So if you really emphasize as part of your culture that we're a meritocracy and we will promote from within when that person is the best person to do the job, not just because they've been here the longest. I think that's absolutely critical at startups because quite often people don't have the skill sets to, to scale up past a certain point. Yeah, exactly. I also want to add something to that. Um, what I see with young companies is um, that they are very bad in promoting people because um, they think that their best salesman is also their best sales manager. But um, the thing is, when somebody is a good expert, that doesn't mean that he's a good manager. So when you are promoting um, people, you should just look at the skills you need for the new role. And um, that's what um, young companies um, exactly are not doing. Um, I know from my experience. So I'm going to go to good tips, I'm sure different experience, more tips we could bring uh, to this question. One very specific question is around internationalization. So one of the big issue of a lot of startups, we're not talking about 500 people, but we're talking about, let's say, 20, 30, 40 people here. When you go from your home market and you try to start in a new country, attracting talents in a different country than your home country is difficult. How do you do that? What is the best recipe? So I can tell you how Rocket is doing that, um, Rocket Internet, and I think they are doing it quite well. It's more or less um, three steps. Step one, you take one guy from your company who has a really, really broad and deep understanding of your um, business. You send him to the market you want to target, and then you hire two to three people, um, locals in this country, who are really from the top of the society, to the top 1%, who are really well connected, and you pay a premium for that, that they are really well connected. And the third step is just that you make it one of the main tasks to um, hire people from the network. And it's working quite well. OK, this is one way. Yeah. Any other way? I think I'd, I'd build on the network side. Of course, I would from LinkedIn. But, um, uh, I, think, <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know, using, using your team to reference as well. So when, we, you know, when, I, when we've expanded into other places, a, you find the best person, and I agree that the, 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 the way that you've recommended is, is very sensible. But when you do the referencing, you need to you know, use your, nefer, your, your network to reference. But I also think you've got a better chance of retaining those people if they've come through your, through your network and they've been qualified as, yeah, they would be actually really interested yeah. in taking, you know, in helping you to take your company there because they've been passionate about that for 20 years. And actually, I know they're a bit bored in their current role, so you know, they're not looking for a job, but if you went and had a coffee with them, they would get excited about what you were trying to achieve, and then they want to jump on, you know, jump on and help you do it together. Which is, and there you just join it, you know, it's very easy to recruit people to you, because what you're doing is you're doing something that they've wanted to do for 20 years already. They just haven't found 
the right team or the right, right way of executing. So you're really helping people, I think, along, along the way, at doing things that they've always really, really wanted to do. Okay. I, I've um, got some personal experience. We, we've recently been scaling up in, in the Valley, and people often find it very hard as an outsider to hire in the Valley because it's such a war for talent there. What I, what I found when I went there is that I was really looking for uh, an individual that had a, had a huge reputation anyway that could multiply themselves, that by hiring that individual, we, I knew that others would become interested in what we're doing, i.e. that they had a better ability to scale himself or herself than, than I would. Um, but the other thing I would say is that really sell into an individual's desire to find meaning in what they do. Um, because people, people like the idea of being hired and then set free, of being able to be really creative. And I always say, look, if you're going to hire someone, great, make sure that you completely set them free. And you can really sell that to individuals, I find, because if you sell the fact that this is an entrepreneurial move for them, they might not be the entrepreneurial type to go and start a business, but they can start a new market. And I think you can really sell that into people's... Uh, to, uh, people's personal motivations and really put yourself in the shoes of their worldview. What is it that makes them tick? And how do you press those buttons then? I just want to add to that. I think the impact and having personal impact, the beauty of small, fast-growing companies is that we can release people to have phenomenal impact that they haven't had before, maybe in their larger company or their other company if it's not growing as fast. So, you know, their impact on the world and wanting to make the world a better place is just what we entrepreneurs, you know, want to do um, is made possible. And that you can't achieve that in a big company. So that's why it's easy to get people from, from larger companies that have already scaled. Thank you. Just, I, I would have one question so, for Ole and Manny. So I'm going to give you, to ask just, you a different yeah. question. Um, the, the question is, when you start growing a business, there is a point in time where you start thinking hiring a first senior executive or let's call him a heavy hitter, okay? And this is always a very delicate time in the life of a company because it's obviously an opportunity and a risk, okay? So first question is, could you explain opportunity and risk here? And second point is, if you do it, if you go ahead, how do you make sure that the person is going to, there is a good chance that you create an environment where you're going to make it work. Should I start? So, 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 after you. <laughs> well, I probably have a very different answer than him. <laughs> um, and it's a very personal thing. Me as when, well. you, when you hire managing directors, it's often thought immediately a direct hire, a direct search. But actually, you could post a listing, and you would be surprised what variety of applications you get. So, and I would actually use a mix of a direct search and really look at what the market is offering. Now, to your second point, I think that's the question where you need to really work with these people. An interview is not good enough. You meet people two hours, three times, doesn't, doesn't really work. You need to get in-depth, you need to get under their skin, skills, skins, you need to understand their thinking, and they need to understand you. And you have basically, I believe, develop a friendship, because at the end, it's trust. When you're going in a foreign market, we all are very similar. However, a few of percentage in the market are very different. And if you don't have the personal experience, you have to trust somebody. So it is a process, an onboarding process of a couple of days or sometimes weeks. You need to take your time. Otherwise, the single failure is tremendous. Yeah, I, th I think where it works well, I think first and foremost, you have to work out what kind of individual you need to bring on board. So. Number one. The second thing is, I think all the stakeholders have to be aligned. So the CEO, the management team, and the shareholders. Because all too often, the reason that senior hires go wrong at the back end is because there's a misalignment of interests and expectations. Then in terms of integrating the individual, it's about making sure that everybody understands what that individual's mand mandate is. So what does success look like in the first six to 12 months? And then you integrate that person on board. Yeah, I also have to add here something. Um, I think it won't make me popular here in this audience, but um, I totally don't believe in um, heavy hitters. Um, I believe in people that um, heavily hit. Um, the thing is, um, I, I mean, I believe in McKinsey guys and the M&A guys who are burning the midnight oil, who are just doing the stuff. Um, I, I, from my personal experience, I know that um, a lot of company, um, when, they want, when they have an open position and a heavy hitter is like emerging on the horizon, they forget everything else, like fit and so on, because it's a heavy hitter. 
And um, maybe to add uh, what um, Ralph said, I, I also don't believe on heavy hitters which are on the market. If you really want to aim for heavy hitters, um, for example, if I, if I were to have to fill the position um, of the new CEO of Monster, I would hit for Ralph. For people who are heavy hitters, who have a job right now, um, where they are really, really good, and you think that you can't get them. If you can get them, then you are right with heavy hitters, but otherwise, I wouldn't hire them. Good. OK. No more? Um, a question around, when we talk about talents, a lot of time we refer to war. It's uh, all this company doing great, trying to attract the best talents. What do you think that a company is going to be more successful than another one at attracting these talents? What does it take? I think uh, to become a talent organization or a talent-centric company, it doesn't happen by accident. I think often CEOs that scale companies around the people they have, if, if you think about the examples of some of the great companies in the world, they really put people first. And I, I think that the founder CEO needs to really think about how do we, from day one, scale and be attractive to the right people. So what is it that we're communicating? What is our employer brand? Because often people think employer brand comes something later. Um, what are the values that we want to develop in people and how do you continue to shift that? Because it's, it's almost like an organis organism. And uh, so I think it's a, it's a continuously work, working project. Um, and I think from a macro picture, um, I've been arguing for a while now that the world's moved from capitalism to talentism, where human capital has become more important than financial capital. So that thing we all learned in school, that cash is king, isn't actually any longer, that actually talent is king and cash follows talent. And I think that's no, uh, no, in no way more important than in startups, because you know, with the right team, cash follows. I think I, my Hello? <laughs> Can you hear? Sorry, I'm, I'll speak yeah. louder into, my, into the microphone. Um, so I think my, I put, take off my LinkedIn hat for a second and put on my investor hat. So I am an entrepreneur turned into an investor. And I think often what we do as a coach and a mentor to the CEO is help them um, plan their talent and, and, and scale their talent and also put things in place and help them spot when, you know, what the gaps are in the team. Because when I was in the trenches, I couldn't recognize things half of the time. Um, but I think the people that you surround yourself with, be they advisors or, or board members, can help you spot where, um, where the gaps are and what you're going to need to fill in in the next six months. And often, even though you know, intellectually you can spot that, if you weren't so much in the trenches, when you're running the company, it's, it's harder to spot. So I think one of the things that I was lucky with, I think I surrounded myself with great investors and also great advisors, and they were always steps ahead of me, um, and I listened to them. So I think listening, if you're the CEO, to the people who you respect around you, um, for them to help you plan your talent is, is a critical thing that is hard to do when you're growing really fast. Sorry, Don, was the question, how do you attract great candidates to a company or, or, or a company's ability to attract a yeah. great candidate? It's a success. The most powerful <laughs> is success. And how do you measure success? It's the quality of the investors, the quality of the management team, the, the momentum. If a candidate believes you've got the right product at the right time and you're executing really well, that's probably the biggest aphrodisiac for attracting a candidate. That's very interesting. I believe you're saying the same here, uh, the two of you, because Basically, how, creating an, how are you going to create an environment where people perceive success? And success obviously comes from the business doing well, numbers, but also comes from the environment you're creating. And you're saying that the advisory you're putting around you can be board members, investors, and so on, also create uh, uh, an environment where people feel like, I want to be part of that. So you need to think in a very strategic way, not just about, again, sharing what you've done, but again, you need to create around the company the right environment to attract these talents. That's I'd add on one thing to is you said that the momentum. Yeah. I think that the individual who you're recruiting believes that they can add to that momentum is if they know that they can impact that and drive it further, I think that's key, key as well. I, I'd say that uh, this, is, this is kind of a dangerous point though, because success is a process. And every startup obviously starts pre-success and is aiming at that. 
And I think that it's very easy to have an awesome culture when the company's winning and when you're scaling and when, you know, to attract people. The challenge that every entrepreneur finds, because most fail before they get there, is how do you create an awesome culture before you're successful so that then you become successful? And, and so I think that, that recognizing that process and recognizing the fact that you know, it's very easy for Google to have this amazing culture because Google's winning. Um, but before you've won, how do you make sure that you have a, an aligned team, that you have a, a single world view of what you're attempting to do and, and the values in sync? So it's a perfect transition to my next point. Um, <laughs> the, the transition you're making is, it's not, we're not talking longer about attracting talent, we are talking about retention of talent here. And it's true that success is an amazing glue for any company. So it's easy to have everybody uh, coming with you when you're very successful. Most companies anyway go through times or periods where it becomes more difficult. And it can still be a great company, but you have difficult times. And so what does it take? And it's very easy, we've seen it a few times, where people basically leave. So it's like big exodus happening at the time where company goes public, bad time, share price down. You, you have many examples in mind. So what does it take to basically keep the people in the trenches and go and fight? Oli, please. I think there's, again, I mean, there's a couple of answers. One is what I found out, what people need is a clear plan. They need to still believe in a vision. They need to see the way out of their problem area. No? And then come all the other things, what you can do in retention that you give them special bonus. Uh, personal attention is an important thing. People are sometimes full of fear. Of course, sometimes you cannot avoid it because it's not really the best environment. But having them and guiding them on a personal level and showing them a clear vision, a way out, that's what usually makes them believe. And the same with the hiring when you start up. They believe in the people. People are work not working for a company. They're working for other people. No? And if they believe in you, they believe in the plan. Yeah, the thing is, I mean, um, we have to look, um, I mean, why are people motivated? And there are three motivators um, for work, why people are motivated to go to work and do their job. And it's not money, it's um, autonomy, it's purpose, and it's mastery. That means um, that they see a higher purpose of what they are doing. Um, that is what um, Ralph said about the vision and about the strategy, that they really know, um, so where are we going to? Um, then it's um, autonomy, that they have their um, free space, that they can um, that they can decide for themselves um, and so on. Um, and uh, mastery means that they are just, um, that they think that they are good in what they are doing and that they see that they are getting better. And um, of course, you can also um, organize your company in a way that people are always getting better, that they are getting tasks or goals they can hit and so on. I think these are the main points, the three main points. What is. Um Around retention, what is your attitude when people want to leave? Let's say you have a great manager, okay, is getting an offer from uh, another company. Do you want to retain him or do you want to let him go? Let him go. Okay. Let him go? Let him go. <laughs> Doesn't Tacti make sense. Tactical question. <laughs> <laughs> I believe this is a question that a lot of people are facing. So what I mean, do you do and what is your attitude? How do you? The basic Handily. decision is let him go. Yeah. But sometimes you have let to be very technical. I think you have to ask why. Why is he leaving? Or why is she leaving? And yep. what's the motivation for leaving? Sometimes it's a simple thing, just miscommunication. You know, an individual feels undervalued for whatever reason. So I think you have to get to the heart of it. If the person is smart, they've really thought about it. And they come to you and say, look, I've looked at all the different angles. I've made up my mind. This is the reason I'm leaving. It's logical. Then you have no choice. Then I think it's, OK, well, Good luck, you want to further your career. We can't offer you that here. But I think you should be able to explore every single avenue before that. And if it's a great manager, yep. you, have to, you explore every avenue to try and keep that person. I think you need to understand why they're going. And I think you can learn an enormous amount from exit, yep. exit interviews. Yep. Um, you know, there was one recently this year, and what we found is that there was a very talented engineer who um, had found another job and was going and had made up their mind, and it was, it was too late. Um, but on the exit interview, this person said, well, you know what, there are, you know, she, it was a woman, she felt she had been treated with disrespect in the company. And that, to, to me, highlighted a cultural issue that we needed to, to, to address urgently, which we did. And so, which means now the rest of the team isn't leaving. But 
the exit interview is so telling. Um, so if they're going, you know, so people would just move on and that's okay. But you have to know why they're going because it could mean that there's something bad going on somewhere yeah. and this is your opportunity to find that out. So it's your eyes and ears to, um, to learn that and to do something about it. We have 20 more seconds. So I would have one <laughs> last question for you, um, which is a very difficult one, I believe. Is in all the early stage company, we come a time where we know that someone doesn't fit, you know, but it's like we probably need to keep him. And most of the time, we realize we should have cut earlier. Okay, so we know that when you feel it, you should. Can you share very quickly your experience? I believe it's something which is pretty valuable to, to the audience in terms of when do you have to act, when you have to make decision. Anybody? As fast as possible. As soon as you recognize it, I think. Yeah. Um, because how do you recognize? If by the time you, how do you recognize it? Well, you can hopefully is not. Is it a gut feeling? Interview. Is it gut feeling is enough, or? I think it's often a gut feeling. And you should talk with your colleagues about it, like, um, yeah. Gut feeling. Gut colleagues. Feeling. Every CEO we've ever worked with has made exactly the same point. I, what's your biggest? When we say what's your, what's been your biggest mistake or biggest learning so far, is I didn't let X, Y, or Z go when I had the gut instinct that it's not working out. The most consistent message. Good. So thank you all. Um, thank you. It was a short session. Hopefully, we've been uh, sharing a uh, quite of tips on a variety of uh, topics. So thank you for having attended. Thank you.